All right, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to another Antler and Featherco podcast, the podcast for new and adult onset hunters. My name is Vince. I'm going to be your host, and this is the show, and this particular show is what it's all about. This is where I, a very inexperienced turkey hunter, bring on somebody who is possibly, I don't know, in my book, he's contending for goat. He's currently, in terms of like active turkey hunters, I think he's the best out there, period, hands down. I don't want to waste a bunch of time on an intro, so we're just going to introduce our guest. We're going to say like maybe 30 seconds of other crap, and we're going to jump into it because I I cannot wait to talk to our guest. So if you've read the title of the show, which you probably already did, we have this week Dave Owens from the Pinhoti Project. Uh, I don't know that I even need to intro Dave. If you are around the hunting community, If you turkey hunt, I think you're all pretty aware of who Dave Owens is. He is an absolute killer in the woods. He is one of the best callers that has ever done it. Um, He's he's just unbelievable in every single way. His content on YouTube, his videos on YouTube are just, they're great. Um, They aren't just... I don't know. When you watch Dave's stuff, you feel like you're there with him. Uh, I think he paints the story really well of the hunt. Um, and so I, I couldn't be more honored to have him on before we do get into it. Just a reminder. Thank you to everybody. Actually, can we do this? Can you be brought to you by your own company? This show, they have co podcast is brought to you by antlerfeatherco.com. Um, for all you guys who are checking it out, all you guys have picked up some, uh, t-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, whatever. Uh, I appreciate it. If you guys haven't checked it out yet, go over to antlerfeatherco.com, pick up some AFCO swag, swag, I don't know that I like that term, but for all my office fans out there, swag. Anyway, if you guys uh, want to go check that out, I'd appreciate it. Thank you for everybody who has, and that's all I'm going to do for an intro because I just want to get into the conversation with Dave. So help me welcome to the show, Dave Owens from the Pinhody Project. Dave, how are you doing today, man? Oh man, doing doing as good as you can in June, man. Lucky to be alive. How about you? Yeah, I, I'm doing pretty good. I think I know for a fact that you um, definitely feel the same. Like, oh my gosh, it's over. Turkey season, it's over. I don't know. I mean, are all, are all the seasons out now? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few folks that like take this off season to chase hogs or um, something like that. But I think that's about the only thing. There's a little bit of trapping going on. Some of that postseason trapping, you know, some of the uh, nest predators are getting picked up here and there, but I think that's super difficult right now with the amount of food out there for them. So, um, other than that, yeah, man, there's not much to chase. It's fishing yeah. season. If you do, if you're into that. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's always bittersweet. Like ever since I started, so I, I told you off camera, I, I think you may be the reason I started, uh, turkey hunting, Um, I don't recall specifically, but I, so like I told you, I started like three years ago. Um, my background is no hunting whatsoever. No, no dad or grandpa or uncle to teach me. So I basically learned archery from John Dudley. I learned deer hunting from the hunting public. And then I think I found you through the hunting public maybe, or maybe it was just a a YouTube, you know, how you, you watch one video and then the next one and the next one. Mm -hmm. Um, and I never really thought about turkey hunting. And then I saw, I remember watching your stuff and I was like, Whoa, this looks pretty cool. Deer hunting's fun. Don't get me wrong. But like, I think you'd agree. Turkey hunting is just a whole nother animal. Um, in terms of, I mean, I like sitting in a tree. I like chasing deer, but there's nothing quite like being in the woods when it's dark and it, it starts sun's coming up. And you hear that first gobble of the spring. I mean, I, and then, you know, when you just, when you get to chase them and play in that game, it's so interactive. And yeah, I really, I, you sparked that interest in me to actually get into that game. And now I'll tell everybody all day long, turkey hunting trumps deer hunting a hundred percent, hundred percent. Like, so thank you for that. And like I said, I'm so excited to have you on here. Like I said, you're one of my, not to be weird and mushy, Um, but you're one of my like turkey hunting heroes. I've learned a lot from you. I've, I've tried to mimic things you've done and screwed up a lot because I'm not you, (laughs) but, (laughs) but no, uh, I think I I just love what you've got going on with the Pinhody project and all that. So 
again, thanks for coming on, spending some time with me on this. Um, before we get into it, I always stop. I start the show with a prayer, um, and then we'll just kick right into the content. I kind of want to find out who you are, who you were before you were, as we all know you, um, kind of how that whole Pinhoti project and the life you got going on now, how that formed. So, sure. all right, man, we'll say a quick prayer and we'll hop into it. Okay. So, Lord, uh, I thank you again for another opportunity to record a podcast and to discuss this just amazing creation that that you have created. We only get to be out in the woods and chasing turkeys and um, networking with each other. And we only get to enjoy this stuff because you said so. Um, apart from you and apart from of just your sheer grace, uh, life on earth would be literally hell. And then after that, more hell, um, even worse. So I'm just, I'm, I'm so, so thankful that you allow us to do what we love to do. Um, and that you've created such an amazing, amazing bird for us to chase such an amazing, uh, just landscape to be out in and reconnect with you and nature and all that, that great stuff that we love. I also thank you for Dave. I thank you for his life. I thank you for all the uh, wonderful talents and gifts that you've given him that he uh, then was generous enough to share with the world. Uh, Dave is a, you don't get much better. Um, and the fact that he's willing to take his time to talk to, to me, a newer hunter and um, spread, you know, share knowledge and everything else. I'm just so very thankful for that. So we, uh, we ask that you'd be with us for the rest of this podcast. Um, we thank you for Jesus, for what he did for us on the cross, and we ask all of this in Jesus' great name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I think the most basic question I want to start with is, how did Dave Owens become Dave Owens? Um, when did you really pick up the passion for hunting? How did you start hunting in general? Um, and then, has it always been turkeys? Did it start it that hasn't. way? No, it, it started with uh, just about how everybody else starts. I had a dad that was a hunter and we had rabbit dogs and we started on small game and everybody was just ripping and raring to go for opening day of dove season. So uh, we were probably your typical little rural, uh, you know, country kids that just wanted to shoot anything that moved and had pellet rifles and no songbird or gray squirrel was safe. You know, that kind of uh, lifestyle. Um my dad is a, a fanatical deer hunter, always has been, uh, and that's kind of was my uh, gateway into into the outdoors. Was just trompsing around and just becoming infatuated with uh, everything outside. Um, turkeys, I kind of dove off in all on my own. I remember, um, you know, I mean, it was heck, I don't know, eleven, twelve years old that that I became infatuated with turkeys, and I've always been one of those kids that was. You know, when I was growing up, I could hear something, something and I could mimic it. You know, I could, you know, whistle really well. I could always mimic songbirds and I could uh, use my hands to, to mimic morning doves. And I'd call them to the to the, you know, the back porch or whatever. So I think turkeys was just a natural progression for me because they're so vocal and you get that uh, auditory um, uh, component there when you're when you're turkey hunting. So um, from there, I just picked up, you know, back in the day, it was VHS tapes and magazines. I mean, um, internet was just now getting up and moving, you know, I was, I was the, the, I was introduced through dial up, you know, with the, with the little annoying little ringing sounds and whatever. So, uh, wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, it was hunting forums after that, you know, you, you, you started, uh, getting on the internet. I didn't have much use for it until I discovered hunting forums and like this hunting community that existed out there and, Got into that and um, just kind of forged my own way when it came to turkey hunting, just uh, trial and error and, you know, read what I could, but, you know, you can't teach experience. So, um, and that's the greatest teacher. So um, just getting out there and just wanting to become better um, and just kind of led me to where I am. You know, I just uh, always spent as much time out there trying to be around turkeys and be successful and figure out what they were doing and why they were doing it and just the, uh, I just always have had like a natural curiosity to the way things work and, uh, and just was like a, a relentless desire to just keep on keeping on just, um, whatever it took to, to learn it, to be successful, to go again, to, uh, just looking for another opportunity. I mean, I was, I was always up for the, whatever, you know, task it was required to, to get there. So, um, that's kind of how I, uh, dove into the turkey hunting thing and what, kind of 
brought me here is just that that relentless pursuit of trying to get better every day. Um, but yeah, that's kind of led me uh, to to be a turkey hunter. Now, did you did you cut your teeth on private land, public land? Like, what was I guess as your because you kind of have a not that you have like a totally different off the wall technique to turkey hunting, but I mean you you have a, you're very good at it. You have um, what seems to be answers for everything. You I'm, I'm sure you've got a system to it. Where did that kind of develop? Um, I know that I've, I shy away and I, I did hunt private this year and I did get a bird in Illinois this year off of private ground, but like, the, I'm sure people will disagree. I have personally found that pr- private land is a little bit, I don't want to say easier, but it's more predictable. Mm-hmm. Um, because you've got trail cams that people have been watching. People know what field they're usually in, in the morning, um, if you've got guys that are bow hunting out of a blind or whatever it may be, um, it's just not the same to me as when you step foot on a piece of public ground where you don't, I mean, you can, you can scout, but you don't know what is going to show up that day because you don't know who was there yesterday. You don't know who was there two hours before you, you're not, really you might not really be sure what the coyote population looks like whatever it may be public land seems like it's much more dynamic um what what, what's your opinion on that i mean did you did you find i guess back to the original question where did you kind of cut your teeth where did you really start learning a lot about the turkey and how to hunt them yeah um we uh were always a part of like a little uh a little hunting club that bordered a big piece of state ground when I was young. My dad was a part of this. I think it was like about 300 acres or so. It bordered state ground. And so um, it didn't take me long, just like I said, that natural curiosity to where I fleshed out that couple hundred acres pretty quick and I quickly Mm -hmm. was on the state ground. So public ground to me was never intimidating because I I Mm -hmm. felt like I hunted it. That's kind of just what I knew. Um, so it wasn't until a little bit later in life and, you know, those internet forums and stuff that I was uh, referring to earlier that I began to understand that there was a lot of people out there that were afraid to hunt public ground. Like it was, it was a scary, you know, thing for them. And it just never, that never occurred to me because it's all I ever knew. Um, my dad was a welder. I mean, he, he was a welder. My mom was a, was a, a paralegal or so a secretary more or less. So I never wanted for anything. They provided, they were there, but it was not like I was afforded, you know, thousands of private acres and, uh, big leases and, you know, that kind of thing. So public land is just what was available to me. Um, so, um, that's just, you know, like I said, that's how I cut my teeth. So I wasn't, I was never, I never shied away from it. As a matter of fact, I'd always, you know, I hunted this public ground. Let me go find the next piece. So I was just always up for the task of conquering somewhere new. Um, yeah. Now, whether I knew what I was doing when I stepped foot on those new pieces, <laughs> I don't know. I didn't have near the uh, uh, the strategical approach that I do now. I think a lot of it was just uh, vin and vigor, hopping in and just, you know, grit, you know. Um, but that's kind of how I did it. Uh, that's how I cut my teeth. And so it was never a scary uh thing for me to, to jump into a piece of public ground. And I think that's what kind of helped me when it came to traveling. Like I did, like I was never intimidated by a piece of ground that, that other people hunted. I was never intimidated by hunting next to other people or having other people around me hunting. Um, but, uh, as far as, you know, private versus public, you know, that big discussion. And and I think it's, it, it should more accurately be be described as pressured versus unpressured birds. So, um, I mean, I, there's some private ground out there that has, you know, eight or 10 really good Turkey hunters on it. Those turkeys are going to be just as tough as any public ground you're going to walk on, you know, but it's like you said, it's, it's, it's the unknown. Uh, it's not knowing what happened yesterday. Um, not knowing what the birds have been, uh, subjected to so far in the season. Um, that's the kind of, um, the thing with public, uh, I uh, just I always had this little little um, little saying where I would say, you know, a public land bird is not any harder to kill than a private land bird, but it's harder to kill a public land bird. And that seems like you're walking in a circle. But what that essentially is meaning is there's so many other components in a public land setting most of the time. Now, here again, that should probably be pressured land, you know, a pressured turkey 
is no harder to kill than an unpressured turkey, but it's harder to kill a pressured turkey. Just back to that same, you know, conversation about pressured versus public, private versus public, you know, or pressured versus unpressured. Anyways, um, because you do have those things that the turkeys have been um, exposed to that may have them uh, acting a certain way or, you know, it's just, they've been conditioned to either being bumped from a certain location or hearing a certain thing and having negative uh, repercussions from approaching it or whatever it may be, those public land birds uh, or pressured birds may have uh, some, you know, quirkiness to them just because of their experiences that, you yeah. know, if you've got a piece of private or unpressured ground, um, those turkeys just, they just act like turkeys, you know, without those outside components. Yeah. And when you go, so obviously if you guys haven't, followed along with Pinhoti Project, maybe you don't know, but I think most of us know, like, you travel a lot. You turkey hunt all over the place. How, do you have, like, a set, um, I guess, a set length that you have figured out with your trips? Like, do you go into a brand new piece and kind of say, I know day one and day two uh, are probably just going to be scouting, or how long do you usually take before you think, at least you figured out a new piece of public or whatever before you really feel like you're in the game. Yeah. There's so many things that go into that. Like if you walk into a new piece of public and, um, you know, un- unseen ground, whether it could be private or public, you've just never been there before. And, and it's a pretty day, bluebird day, high pressure. And you go in and you flesh it out and you don't hear a turkey gobble. That is, you know, completely different whether you walk through that piece of ground and it's a nasty overcast spitting rain day. Um, you know, on the spit and rain day, I may say, you know, there may be turkeys there that weren't gobbling today because the weather was trash. Um, to where if it was a bluebird day, I'm like, I am confident that there's not a killable turkey or I say killable, like a turkey that I want to pursue is not on that property because he would have given me one gobble today. Um, so, um, you know, and as far as the time, um, not really any, uh, any data or any kind of, um, anything that I run off of in no kind of historical like limits I give myself as far as, you know, get a Turkey here, get a Turkey there. I just always try to um, have a starting point and I have a few starting points when I go to somewhere that's unfamiliar. Um, typically that's kind of situated around efficiency. I like trying to hunt with my ears and keeping my fingers crossed for good weather so that I can, I can in fact hunt with my ears because that's mm-hmm. my preferred way of doing it. And, um, just trying to put myself to where I got my ears on as much ground as possible and have that ground be suitable turkey habitat. So most of the time you can determine that through satellite imagery and, uh, and topo maps and that kind of thing. So you can kind of put yourself, you know, quote unquote in the game before you ever reach the, reach the, uh, destination. Yeah. And when did you, so you talked about starting out and then you, you know, we got the internet rolling in, you're on forums. When did you decide to pick up a camera how did uh how did that kind of get to be a thing? Did you used to videotape yourself long before you ever started a YouTube channel? Oh or- yeah, man. We've we've carried a video camera. I remember back in the day, um, we had a class in high school. I can't remember what it was, it was like media or media something and, and and it was a class that taught you how to make a PowerPoint presentation and how to yeah, you know, whatever. We had to put together a little uh a little video montage of some sort and me and a couple of my buddies put together a hunting thing and called it (laughs) something but after that we started carrying those cameras around and calling it the chronicles or uh the hunting chronicles or something and we have all we have these little not the little bitty cassette tapes that your video cameras used to use back before the dvd the little disc um and we had just leagues of that, of, uh, of deer hunting and waterfowling and turkey hunting. And so, yeah, we've always kind of done that. Uh, I started getting into the, obviously the turkeys and, and high school ended, everybody went to college, everybody kind of went their own ways and, uh, got into different things. And I kept carrying a camera when it was convenient at that point. Like if I had filled my, uh, Georgia tags or, um, uh, it, basically if it was convenient, if I had a buddy in town and he was going to be on the gun or something, I would carry the carry the camera um at that moment in time uh but it wasn't a priority uh until yeah. um you know in, in 2018 is when we kind of decided the Pinhoti project was going to be a thing and that's when that's when the camera had 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 become a you know a third arm so 
Can you imagine back when you first started carrying it, when you were doing your high school project, if someone had been like, hey, try this. It's a GoPro. <laughs> or like, you know what I mean? Yeah, like the cameras. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, self-filming is very difficult. I blew a, and I, I'm from Iowa, so I mm. blew my first season Iowa opportunity because I had it. I had a GoPro mounted to the front of my shotgun, and uh, I saw him coming in. He was totally silent. He went behind a log, I thought, and I went to click it on because I just I'm not very good with it yet, mm-hmm. so I don't always have it running. And somehow, when I that small movement of clicking, when I thought he was completely behind a tree, it blew him out. Oh yeah, but. I, so I can't imagine like we all sell, everybody self films now in one way or the other. It's just mm-hmm. part of what we do with phones and everything else. But I can't imagine lugging around like an old, I think my first memory of a camera was when I was really little, when they were the full blown big on the shoulder ones. And then I remember when the handhelds that kind of swiveled came out, my grandpa had that for me in wrestling. <laughs> and it's like to see where video cameras were when people started like really trying to video hunting shows to where they are now. If you were to bring this technology back then, it would be so al- like, <laughs> yeah, there's, so be, there's no telling as much as those guys and, and uh, were able to collect with that type of equipment. I can't imagine if you gave them the capabilities. Cause you know, I talked to cuz Strickland and those guys and you see yeah. the pictures of them and they literally have the camera on their shoulder. Like it's this yeah. huge thing. And he used to talk about how they used to, have to switch those tapes out and each tape would only be good for like 28 <laughs> minutes or something. And it was like, Whoa, like, and they're now, loud. Yeah. Now we have a 256 gig SD card and I can just roll for days <laughs> right. on that thing, you know? Right. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's, it's the, the self filming thing I think has even become possible because of the advancements in technology when it comes to uh, video cameras, because I mean, now yeah. I carry on a video cameras is, you know, much, not much bigger than, I don't know, like a, a can drink and uh you know it's 4k footage and uh i can attach an external mic and i can clip it on my shoulder strap so i mean yeah um just having that kind of stuff i don't see how it would be where it is today if that that hadn't made its progression yeah it'd be really interesting to see like and not that not that cuz isn't still good or anything like that he's cuz is still great but like Mm -hmm. it'd be cool to see those guys like in their prime when they were when they were actually, you know, during the VHS time, mm-hmm. if they had the tools we had today, because like you're saying, the stuff they were able to get, um, like it, it had to have been way more difficult when you've got those video cameras that are like they're running and you can hear them and the tapes are moving and they're clicking and beeping. Um, I remember hearing Cuz talk about like, I think it might have been he was video in Will Primos or something and forgot to hit record or something like that mm-hmm. or something. Ha- I would just be curious, like if those guys had the tools we have now, what, what else would they have gotten? Yeah. The I stuff mean, that they got was still great. It was still you know? great. But if you watch back at all those old VHS tapes, like they were selling VHS tapes and they were advertising and, and pimping 12 kills, uh, 14 on camera kills. Yeah. Um, like, well, look now, you know, I mean, <laughs> that that's not a whole lot um the, the the amount of places you can get a camera now allows you the capabilities of capturing much more of that stuff that they were around i'm sure that just didn't get caught on camera because of one reason or another so um right yeah i think uh the, those guys would would be pumping out the stuff just like we do now um yeah. with that kind of technology so talk about Pin Hody project. So you said in 2018 is when you kind of decided to really kick that off. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the inspiration for the name? Uh, what is that for, for people who don't know? I only know because I looked it up today. Yep, but yep. <laughs> what uh, what does uh, Pin Hody mean? Um, and why was that what you decided to call your project? Uh, Pin Hody is a Creek Indian word for uh, turkey home is its, its uh, native meaning. Um, and it's uh, just a popular hiking trail that runs, runs through the national forest and um, private and public land it goes across but it just kind of comes cuts right across my hometown and um and so it just kind of was always been kind of part of life you rode by you saw the name and um and whatnot so it just uh made sense when we were trying to brainstorm a name for this thing uh courtney and i were actually riding down the road and saw it and she's like you should call it Pinhody outdoors or something since that's uh, mm-hmm. you know got turkey meaning and i was like you know what 
you're on to something there, you know, yeah. you're on to something. Yeah. And that's where Penhody project was born. And, um, here we go, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Did, was your, uh, I guess this is for everybody who, I, I feel like everybody who hunts has a something or something outdoors, at least on Instagram, everyone's got a mm -hmm. YouTube channel. What were the beginnings of that? Like, when did it, did it take off right off the bat or did you have some humble beginnings and kind of grew to where you are now? Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, now I would say, and I'm not saying this to like kiss your butt or anything, but you, if you're not the biggest Turkey uh, hunting YouTube channel, I, I don't know who would be. <laughs> so what did it start off? Like, did you come out of the gates on fire or did you kind of have to struggle through some tough years? Man, I mean, uh, it honestly has, uh, is, has been pretty, um, humbling from the beginning because we kicked this thing off, uh, not really realizing what we were creating. Um, still don't realize what we've created. You know, I don't think, <laughs> Amen. um, we just, we just go day to day, you know, um, it's, uh, just started as just like a little thing on the side, you know, everybody, um, was, uh, still plugging away and, and having a, you know, a normal life. And, um, we just felt like there was a, a, a necessity for it really. I mean, I honestly, I just, I, I was seeing, uh, a tradition that I loved and kind of a craft that I had, uh, grown to appreciate kind of being overshadowed, um, and you made a statement earlier about how I, I, I turkey hunt a little bit different or I, I, you know, and the thing about that is I turkey hunt. There's a ton of people that turkey hunt just like I do. There just wasn't, it wasn't documented. Like when it came to a video camera, there was always decoys involved and that field hunting was, it was most popular because that's where you get your footage and that's where it was easiest to get the camera on the turkey. That's just kind of where it came together most often. Um, and you didn't see people dragging cameras onto public ground and going into the timber that much. And it wasn't because they weren't doing it or they hunted. I hunted like some crazy way or had some, you know, these uh, profound uh, tactics or strategies that got more turkeys killed or anything because there's a ton of people that hunt just like I do and do just like I do. Um, it just the camera wasn't involved. Um, and that's kind of something we even struggled with at the beginning is, or, you know, and that's, that's a kind of a question for the outdoor industry as a whole, are we carrying cameras into places they don't, they don't belong. Um, but then you hear stories like yours, um, to where you're like, you know, I wasn't a turkey hunter. I wasn't even a hunter, but then I saw this and now I'm sure you're involved in hunting as much as you can possibly be. You care about the, the resource you're, I'm sure you're, you know, uh, are familiar with the conservation movements and how we're going to need to be putting more turkeys and, and more animals on the ground than we're taking. So um, that's why overall, I, I feel like this, uh, this movement, this kind of a, a spotlight on turkeys or on conservation and everything is it's going to be for the greater good. Um, and that was one of those sidebars of the Penhody project that I didn't even realize was going to be a thing. You know, we were uh, started a project because we kind of saw the traditions and the way that we hunted kind of being overshadowed. And, I, you know, we just had these conversations to where, you know, if somebody wanted to turkey hunt, like they don't have the magazines and the VHSs that we did. DVDs mm -hmm. are even becoming hard to find because it's all digital now. It's all YouTube or Mossy Oak Go or these streaming platforms. Um so what are they going to do? And we're like, well, they're going to go to YouTube and they're going to Google turkey hunting. And right. if you went to YouTube and probably still so, um, you Google turkey hunting, that does that, that, that's like apples and oranges, uh, compared to the way I turkey hunt and, and, and the way I feel about it. Uh, and frankly, there was a lot of folks out there. I mean, it just kind of making a mockery out of something that we held so near and dear. It was kind of insulting to us. And so, um, we figured we would throw our name in the hat, show how we did it and the respect and, and dedication that we show to the craft. And, um, you know, it just, it resonated with a lot of people. I mean, we knew it would because I knew there was a, there was a league of folks out there that, that did it like I did and appreciated it like I did. Um, and man, it just, you know, it just, like I said, it resonated with a lot of folks and a, a bunch of folks appreciated that, that, um, that somebody was going through the, the, the difficulties of dragging a camera and trying to get that kind of stuff on, on film. And, uh, yeah, I mean, as far as like, um, you get humbled every year. I mean, turkeys do that more than anything, but as far as being in this quote unquote industry and kind of, uh, kind of walking into 
you know, a door that I didn't know that I was going to open. Um, you get humbled every day because, you know, you're still a small fish. I mean, you know, the way that, that everything's set up now, it's, it's big conglomerates for the most part. So, I mean, it's not like no matter who you are, you're a nobody to most folks, you know? Um, and even in the grand scheme of things, like you'd be the best turkey hunter, the best turkey caller or whatever. Most folks don't know you at Walmart. You know what I mean? You're not the right. president, you know? So right. it's really <laughs> right. small in the grand scheme of things. And that's just, uh, uh, something that I always try to keep in, you know, in the, in the front of my mind is, is, uh, I don't know, it just humility was one of those things that I saw probably in turkey hunting and waterfowling. It seems like nobody was humble in the sport. And, um, it, I don't know, there would just seem to be a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I guess it's social media. It, it appears that there's a lot more chest beating and look at me's and, um, while I appreciated people turkey hunting and, and, and taking it seriously, um, I didn't like the lack of, of humility in what I was seeing through the media side of it. So, um, and you know, I get those criticisms now, Oh, you hunt and you kill this. And this is how many, you know, turkeys that I watch die on your video and you're showing off. And, and I'm like, no, I'm not. That's never my intentions. Like I hunt, put my, you know, put my, pants on the same way everybody else does um you know well yeah at the end of the day i mean you can how how would you say you're showing like you're just successful and the, the you know that's not showing off you've just gotten really good at something you know what you're doing and uh i just set my life up for this stuff and now we i just was on a podcast a couple of days ago had this same exact conversation to where um I hope people realize like what I have set my life up for, what I have kind of uh, compromised for, what I have, you know, my sole focus has been to give myself flexibility to turkey hunt during the spring. Like, I don't care what I had to do during the nine months before and after. Like, I just wanted those three months to be mine. Um, so um, they have to realize like, oh, sh you know, the Pinhoti guy, he kills one every day. I mean, you know, the Pinhoti guy, he, he kills um, uh, a turkey every other episode or whatever that, you know, that comment may be. And I'm like, you know what, we, we do put a lot of turkeys in front of the camera, but what you have to realize is I've set my life up for this. So like when somebody, if I'm in Alabama and somebody calls me in Tennessee, like, Hey man, it's going to be a pretty day tomorrow. The turkey switch just flipped. <laughs> I'll be there by daylight. So right. it's like those <laughs> special four or five days of the season that we all kind of get once a year, hopefully to where, the the stars align, the barometric pressures rising, the bluebird days, and all the turkeys are gobbling for those three or four days in a row. Like I travel the country chasing those three or four days in every state. You know, it may be the first through the third in Alabama. It may be the, you know, uh, the twenty seventh through the twenty eighth in in you know in uh, in Wisconsin. It may be the twenty second and twenty fourth in Minnesota. Like I chase those magic days when the weather is. I've been known to you know have a rain cloud blow in, you know, it's going to rain here tomorrow. Well, four and a half hours up the road, it's not going to rain. And that's where I'm going to be at daylight, you know? So, um, it's having that kind of flexibility, which makes it appear that I'm better than I am because I, I my success percentages <laughs> is, is, is just, you know, is just the same as most folks. Well, and it's difficult. I mean, in the world that we're in, I mean, yeah, most of the time you're seeing successful people. And, you know, I, I, I do think, obviously I'm not at the point yet <clears throat> with my project where like, I'm quitting my job and we're doing this full time. I'm still, I'm working towards, you know, is this thing ever going to be anything like that? I don't know. But I think it's really easy to sit on Instagram and be like, God, all he does is kill things. Good for him. He gets to drive around and just do whatever he wants. And it's like, do you understand the work that he had to put in to get to where he is now? That's and overlooked think, so often. Yeah. yeah. And I think people, I mean, even even just with my, on my level of like, you know, the podcast and everything else, like we don't just produce this stuff. Like life isn't always just like, you're just running a hundred percent awesome all the time. Like, I mean, think about it, your job and you know, lu lucky for you, you've been, you've worked your ass off to be able to set yourself up to go turkey hunt. But then people <laughs> Like, do you think he enjoys driving across the country all the time? Like <laughs> driving's not fun. Traveling's not fun. Like the, the couple hours he gets to be in the woods 
is the fun part. Sometimes when you're, I'm sure you have days where you're like, man, that sucked. Yeah. I got, but like people don't just because it's, it wouldn't be interesting to make a video about you driving nine hours to the next spot. But like people don't ever see that. So they think like, Oh, I am sitting here. I work my ass off at a job full time all the time. And if I only had the time he had, and it's like, yeah, but you're, you are not given enough credit in, in areas of, of sacrifice and work and just like gritting your teeth to get to the next stop. I th- there's so much more behind it that we don't see on social media. Yeah, but I don't want to, um, um, for sure. I mean, I get those comments all the time and I'm like, you know, this didn't happen by accident. You know, I just, yeah. I, I mean, granted, I'm the luckiest man in the world. I'll tell you that day in and day out. I'm the most fortunate human being as far as what I love to do. I couldn't be any happier. I mean, um, but it didn't happen by accident. You know, it, I just didn't walk into this. Somebody didn't just say, Hey, you know, I didn't wake up to an email with a, with a new bank account <laughs> full of money. Like I just, I didn't. Yeah. And I, I wake up every morning scared to death. Like how am I going to make a dollar today? You know, and right. if, and if you're up for that kind of life, then, then you can kind of do this. But, you know, I don't have a golden goose. Like I don't have a trust fund. Like I, I wake up every morning trying to figure out how I'm going to keep this thing going, how the, how the wheels are going to keep spinning because all I care about doing is, is next March, I want to be in the woods. Um, that being said, I don't want this thing to turn into a pity party either. Like, because I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me because I'm doing exactly what I was meant to do. In my opinion, like I am, I am, I'm home. Like if I'm living in the back of a truck, I'm driving six hours, I'm driving 12 hours. I'm going from one side of the country to the other, like, um, you know, eating, you know, gas station food and sleeping in rest stops and showering at loves and, uh, filling up at pilot, you know, I, I, that's my life and, and I would have it no other way. And there's, um, I make sacrifices every day. I make sacrifices today. I make sacrifices tomorrow and there's lifetime sacrifices that I'm, I'm having to make, you know, that there's things in life I'll never be able to do and never be able to accomplish because this is a life that I've chosen. But people just kind of overlook that, you know, they just don't realize that like all the, the everyday things that they get to enjoy that I don't have because I choose mm-hmm. to live my life for those three months like that, you know? Um, yeah. but like I said, I don't want it to turn into a pity party because I, as far, I mean, it's just what I love to do. So I'm, I'm right at home with it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, like I said, it, to your point, yeah, we're not, I'm not bringing this up to make it seem like you guys need to stop hating on Dave. Like <laughs> I, you, you, you know, you did choose, you chose the the career path that you did and you know, you've worked your ass off and it's successful. Um, but there is, I, I think we lose because of social media. I think we lose the fact that like, we look at like the, the music world. I think we, we, we take things from other, other parts of society and kind of, you look at so-and-so and they're on MTV or whatever, they're on the radio and they suck. And then you find out they were the record executive's daughter <laughs> and you're like, Oh, I see what happened here. Yeah. And it's like, we almost think that same way. Like, Oh, Dave must've known somebody yeah. in the industry that just was like, Hey, do you want to be the face of Turkey hunting? You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, it is a grind. And like, even I, I I've talked to enough, I guess what you consider bigger names in the hunting industry that, you know, there are those guys that are on a whole, like maybe it's the guys from back in the day, they had shows and they're big and, uh, you know, they have big, um, partnerships, but most of the people that are putting stuff out right now that we all love, um, most of the celebrities to us, like they're grinding just as hard as you are. They're just Mm -hmm. doing something different. And I yeah. think we don't appre- we don't appreciate that enough. The digital platform created that. You know, the the ability um everything changed when cable TV started seeing its way out and the digital uh uh media kind of became, you know, pushed to the front because people like myself, we proved ourselves first. Um yeah. back in the day you had to go beg and borrow to get the money to be featured on like Outdoor Channel and Sportsman's Channel or Pursuit Channel, whatever it may have been back in the day. And, um, you had to get, you know, X amount of thousands of dollars to buy each episode to get it just featured. So you had to go beg and borrow for that stuff. So essentially you were held accountable by these, um, brands or products or whatever, whoever it may, you, you may have gotten sponsored by, um, to produce a certain number of whatevers, you know, and now the way it's kind of turned around, um, whether that's for the good or for the bad is, is 
people like myself prove ourselves before we ever approach or are ever approached. Um, and we right. get to kind of, um, like for me, if I use a product and I like it, then maybe I'll approach that person about, a, uh, some kind of partnership, but I don't have to go and kind of sell my soul. I guess you can say to support a product that's junk because yeah. I've already taken their money. You know what I'm saying? So, right. um, right. it's, um, it's kind of made that whole, um, that whole side of things a little bit more, I won't call it reliable. Maybe I needed to call it reliable. I don't know. It's just, a, it's a little more believable, a little more um, transparent now because a lot of these folks, you can go watch them and they were, they're using the same stuff. Like I've owned, you know, I've worn mossy oak camouflage since the beginning of time. You know, it's just lucky mm -hmm. enough that they saw the worth in me to invest in me and become one of my partners and whatnot. And um, I was able to approach mossy oak with like, Hey, this is what I've already accomplished without anything. Um, so right. that's kind of changed um, the way that whole thing is kind of situates itself. All right, guys, let's take a quick break from the show so I can share the friends of the AFCO podcast with you. For starters, we have More Innovations. More Innovations is a 3D printing company. Uh, they make a lot of really cool caddies for those of you who are working on your own bows at home. Um, it keeps all of your thread, parts, tools all in one spot so you're not losing them. Um, but that's not all. He has arrow quivers for the wall so you can wall mount it he's got the uh, five arrow pocket quiver he's got a really cool grenade pen holder that i love to use at work um just awesome all around so check out moreinnovations.com use code all caps afco10 that's going to get you 10 percent off over at moreinnovations.com secondly adam's precision archery um adam's precision archery and myself dustin i almost said adam um we are the inventors of the fanny pack arrow. Um, <laughs> I just love that thing, man. But if you guys are in the market for a new set of arrows, hit up adamsprecisionarchery.com. Uh, they will hook you up. You can totally customize your arrow however you want it. Um, if you want to use code all caps AFCO10, that'll get you 10% off your arrow build over at adamsprecisionarchery.com. Thirdly, my boys at Buzzard Roof Saddles. Buzzard Roof Saddles are the most comfortable, most adjustable saddles. Your butt will love it. Get one now, get practicing so that when it comes time to hunt, you're already ready to roll out and you can just get in the tree and start killing deer. Check them out at buzzardroofsaddles.com. Use code all caps AF. Oh no, excuse me. All caps AAFP10. That's going to get you 10% off at Buzzard Roost Saddles. And guys, I got good news. Our Grounds Coffee Co. is still the official coffee of the AF Co. podcast and the roaster is here. Uh, Ed will be pumping out that coffee soon while we're still waiting for it. Make sure you're going over to ourgroundscoffeeco.com, pick up some merch, help them out there, and just patiently wait because the coffee is on the way. Use code all caps AFCO and that'll get you 15% off at ourgroundscoffeeco.com. Pursuit Energy. Guys, we've been talking about this. It is my energy drink of choice. We're trying to take over the hunting world, make it the number one energy drink in the hunting community. Guys, check it out. They have sugar options. They have zero sugar options. I'm a zero guy. Um, they all taste great. So check them out at pursuitenergy.com. And finally, quick camo, Q-U-I-K camo. I wore their stuff all turkey season. I love their hat with the mask and the gloves. The uh, leafy suit is a leafy suit. It's a good leafy suit. It works. It looks like leaves. It hides you. Um, but if you guys are looking to get some of that stuff, whether it's for deer or for next turkey season, use code all caps AFCO10. That's going to get you 10% off at quickcamo.com. So let's get right back into the content with Dave from the Pinhody Project. So to kind of flip the flip the direction of the conversation, I am curious. You obviously um one of the big things you're known for is your turkey calling ability. Um, you mentioned that you've just kind of been able to mimic things your entire life. When did you get into the competition side of that? And how, like, what does that even look like? How do you even get into a turkey calling competition? You just, like, how does that start? You just get up the nerve to jump in with the both feet. That's, that's the best. I mean, and I would suggest anybody that wants to further their self as a turkey hunter, like become somewhat proficient with a call. You don't have to be anywhere close to the guys you're hearing on TV. Um, 
but you know they've got amateur divisions or hunter divisions they'll call them and you can jump in there and compare yourselves to people who have never won a contest like that's the mm-hmm. you know, the qualifications you can't you can't have won a contest and be in the hunters division so right. you can get in there with <laughs> folks that you know are on your same kind of experience level but you jump in there um I was, like I said, I always just, I, I've, I've had a, a mouth yelper around since the beginning of time. It seems like I was always infatuated with turkeys and the sounds, and I just have a knack for hearing something and being able to replicate it. And in my ear, uh, the way I produce it kind of comes across, I guess, to everybody else is the way it sounds when I heard it. So, um, and, and remarkable enough, I'm not a music guy. Like I, most of these folks that, that do oh, turkey really? calling, they have a musical ear, they play an instrument or something. I don't like, I, I, right. uh, it's like one of the laughing, you know, one of the things people laugh about, cause I've made mention of this. And then the people that have traveled with me, I don't listen to music. Like I'll be on a six hour, 12 hour road trip and I'll never turn on the radio. Um, no because kidding. that's my thinking time. <laughs> like if I'm at home, I'm in front of a machine, um, trying to accomplish, trying to be productive. Um, if I'm out, I'm usually in conversation with someone. Um, so the time behind the wheel is my only thinking time, really. Like that's mm-hmm. when I have ideas and I'll write them down or I'll have, I'll be making to-do lists. Like I think about all the things that I was need to accomplish while I'm driving and I can't accomplish them. You know how that works. You don't ever think about what yeah. you needed to do until you lay down to go to sleep. Um, right. So um, I don't know. I just, when I drive, I, I, I think. And I listen to the roar of the tires and that's kind of what, what I do. So, um, so like, I'm not, I'm not a music guy, uh, but, um, I was just pushed toward trying to do the competition call. You ought to enter those contests, man. You ought to enter those contests. And I just jumped in with both feet. I didn't enter a hunter's division or anything. I just jumped into the open in Georgia. Whew, I wish I knew what day I wish I knew what year that was. Um, it had to be like, 2000 maybe so you were pretty young when you decided to start oh uh, you say that i was probably gosh how old was i um not very young so most of the guys that are in the tur- competition turkey calling thing they go through the the pulse division then they go through the intermediate division which is like i think 16 to 20 uh is the intermediate mm-hmm. division um and i was older than that when i started so i was god if it was what if it was 2000 i was so I don't know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. So um, you're looking at, you know, 20 years old or so, you know. Um, how how old is Dave Owens? So I'm 38. So, you know, I was probably. <laughs> oh, eight, you're making yeah, it was, seem like you're like no, 60. <laughs> no, uh, I was like. I was like, are you way older my, than what you no, look? No, I'm, I'm doing math off, off the cuff here. Just trying to think of, I'm trying to, I'm confusing the years oh. and the days. So if it was, I mean, so 2008, so whatever that is when, um. 2000 i'm trying to think what year i won it oh i'm getting my numbers fixed mixed up too so it's about 2010 i'm sorry not 2000 because i won i won the grand nationals in 2018 and that's what i'm basing all this up i think i had been calling for six years when i won the grand nationals so you're looking at 2012 um so um whatever that equates to you know don't look to me to do math i'm not i'm not gonna be able to help you with that so yeah, you're looking at what, 30 years old, maybe? I mean, not 30, but uh, 20 years old. Yeah. So, I don't know, 25, something around there. That's pretty cool. So I've got a, I've got a theory, and you, you'll, you're probably the, one of the best ones to just disprove it and tell me to never say this again. But with my experience in the woods, which, like I said, I've only turkey hunted, I've only turkey hunted for two years. I've only, I've hunted for a little over three. Um, I have noticed that a Newer hunters, uh, well, not even newer, uh, most turkey hunters are, they will be very shy on a call because they just don't think they sound good enough. Mm -hmm. Um, especially with a mouth call, people get really weird about like, oh, I don't sound like Dave Owen. So I, I'm just going to use one of the little clicker boxes or like a box call or a slate call that I know I can kind of at least sound decent. Um, and one of my things is in my observations when I've been around hens, they, they sound terrible. <laughs> and so you, you hear a real hen who sounds like not very good. And then you go to like, you watch a competition with guys like yourself. Um, you could name off some of the other really good callers, Buttsky, Drury, all those guys, the old school guys that I've listened to. And you guys sound obviously very good and you're winning nationals with it and all that stuff. 
do we do you think that people put too much uh weight on how they sound in the woods um and and how necessary is it to sound like you do um and where where's the advantage and benefit and i'm not disagreeing that there is one there obviously is but if a guy like when you when you're a, a grand national caller where do you find the benefit in your calling ability over say just your random normal guy who can sometimes get a couple good yelps out, where are you gaining advantage by the, your calling ability? Um, it's all, uh, confidence has a huge part in it and being able to say something when you need to say it is, is, is more important in my opinion than the actual like replication of the perfect yelp or high end, low end, you know, just having the perfect rasp and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. It's, it's knowing and being able to respond to the turkeys um, timing has a, a huge part in that, I think. And I think when somebody has to think about what they're doing and they have to concentrate on making a good sound, um, they're not going to be able to uh, efficiently replicate the sound that, that needs to be made in the time frame that needs to be made. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, I think like when you're responding to a turkey gobbling, I think the, the, the it's a matter of seconds. If you're a couple seconds late, it just doesn't carry the same amount of enthusiasm that you're trying to portray there when you're trying to tell that gobbler like "Ooh, i heard that and i really liked it like if it's a yeah. couple seconds late it kind of loses that um that's yeah. like uh being burned by a stove or being burned or being pinched if somebody pinches you and then four seconds later you go oh they're gonna say well that didn't really hurt you that bad you yeah. know because it was four yeah. seconds late but if you immediately was like oh they're like oh yeah that that hurt them you know so it's yeah. that that kind of mentality and being able to have the confidence to make a sound um, at the precise time that it needs to be made. I think that's the biggest thing that calling confidence gives you. Um, And then when you get into situations where you're having to call with hens, and a lot of my videos, you'll see a lot of calling, uh, over-calling a lot of people. It's one of the most common. He he over-called to that turkey, and I'm like, well, he's upside down. Like, how how over-called was it? Because it worked, (laughs) you know? Right. Um, But uh, you get those comments a lot, and it's just – if you're confident that you sound like a turkey, then I think it's almost impossible to, uh, I don't want to say it's impossible to overcall because you can most definitely overcall. But most of the overcalling that I've seen have a negative effect had a lot to do with the calling not being turkey in the first place. So it had a lot to yeah. do with, uh, and, you know, uh, a lot of that has to do with volume as well, you know, because um, yeah. people are really apt to call too loud to a turkey that's close, you know, and yeah. um, because it's easier to get a turkey-ish sound out of a mouth call when you force a lot of air over it. Um, it's right. really hard to replicate those, that high, the clean front, and then, you know, that, that roll over. It's hard to do that softly. So just yeah. people, you know, just because of the ease and the flexibility of, of using the call and making it sound good, they're, they're calling too loud. Um, and, um, you know, just the competition side of things, it makes you practice more. I mean, it made me practice more. Yeah. I'm very undisciplined when it comes to practicing and running calls, <laughs> and I'm just very undisciplined when it comes to that. So the competition side of things makes me build more calls. It makes me – um you know, just flat out practice more, just make sure that I'm polished and that works on your confidence and being able to replicate those sounds and being able to do it immediately. Um, and then, I mean, it does kill more turkeys. Now, how many It's always up for debate? Um, I don't think it's that many, but it is a few, you know? Um, and, uh, because there are some times to where, you know, I feel like that turkey wouldn't have committed or you wouldn't have got him into that location without him just being absolutely 100% convinced that there was a hen over there. You know, if there would have ever yeah. been anything out of place, if, if the rhythms, cadence, or whatever had to put any doubt into his mind. And it's not like I'm he's, he's thinking that's a hunter over there or that's not a legitimate, you know, hen. It's just, like I said, I think it's got more to do with fooling him by the uh, when you make that call. You know, I think, it, yeah. you know, and being able to like, uh, control his, uh, his enthusiasm and control his yeah. uh, excitement by uh, being able to give him certain calls that may be a little bit more difficult to replicate or at least do in a timely fashion and doing it at the right volume. And there's just so many little components that, that are, that go into the calling thing. Um, 
that uh, that have to kind of, you know, that are lumped into one. And I think it really has to be broke down to really kind of discuss it. Well, and obviously experience is the only way to learn all of that stuff. But I do, it's interesting that you started talking about just the timing of the call because it, especially when you're newer and you're watching all the videos, everyone's telling you that, you know, here's the top five sounds you need to learn how to make. Um, and you can sometimes get some context as to when or why you would make these sounds, but I'm sure it's out there, but I've personally never heard somebody talk about the timing of it in terms of, you know, saying like, if you're four seconds late, that can not saying it's always going to ruin it, but just like being that involved in the game that you're aware of, like, uh, I, I might not have called back soon enough or the right timing, uh, I, that's just interesting to me that, cause I've, I've haven't heard that before. Um, and now I'm just gonna, I'm going to screw up more hunts cause I'm going to start yelping back as soon as I hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just like, uh, it's just like conversation. It's like a knee jerk response. A lot of times if you get in amongst a group of turkeys and, um, I think I've, I've, I've spoke to it, hens and Jake's do it alike, but you always hear like the Jake talking to a duck gobbler drumming. You hear him drum and the Jake calks. Um, hens mm-hmm. do the same thing. And, um, uh, you know, if, if, if you can get close enough to hear a turkey drumming and you respond to his drumming, it's just like responding to his gobbling. Like everybody yeah. always expects to yelp to a turkey and have him gobble, yelp to a turkey, have yeah. him gobble, cut to a turkey, have him gobble. Um, my, uh, approach has always been, uh, you know, uh, he's liking what he's hearing and he's responding what if we like what we hear and we respond to him? That's my, that's the way I kind yeah. of visualize that. And if he gives us a sound and we tell him that we like it, like that's only going to convince him that he needs, you know, he needs to be more yeah. involved in our conversation. So um, that's just kind of something that I've found extremely effective. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of, it's interesting to think about like, I know we always talk about, you know, you're having a conversation with them, but when you really, for some reason, my mind went, when you're saying that my mind went to like, imagine, imagine you're, you're a guy or a girl and you're in the middle of a conversation. I mean, this happens a lot nowadays where someone's got a phone. If, if you're like, Hey, how's it going? And someone doesn't respond for four seconds or their face is in their phone and they're, I mean, that would turn you off as a person. It would turn you off to that conversation. Yeah. And when I you mean, really think about what we're doing, we, you know, we, we are trying to have a conversation with that bird. It's not just, I make noise and I hope he makes noise and then I'll make more noises and hope that he gobbles. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, rem- I think that's really good. It's remembering like you were actively having a conversation with this animal, just like you would a person. And if you ignore, you know, both ways. But if you, if he says, yells, Hey, at you and you ignore him for five seconds and then you're like, Oh, Hey, you know, obviously that, that Turkey probably is like, eh, whatever. Yeah, it doesn't, you know? it definitely doesn't hold the same amount of enthusiasm. And as much as we're discussing, you know, or not discover as much as we're trying to have a dialogue with these animals, we're trying to control, or at least I'm trying to control that dialogue as well. Cause if I have it yeah. my way, I'm going to start the dialogue and I'm going to ramp up the enthusiasm. I want to get him more excited. I want to, I want to get him to where he's really on edge. I mean, that's, I'm, so I'm constantly trying to build that discussion to where he's getting more and more excited. And I'm doing that by saying, Oh, I really like what you said. Oh, that really sounded good. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm jumping on and, and trying to control that discussion by building the excitement and keeping that excitement level high because in my opinion, if his excitement level's high, he's got more of a opportunity or he, I can talk him into making a mistake more readily right. in, in other words. Right. Um, but you have to read the discussion. Sometimes you can try to do that and it just flat out doesn't work. You can tell that he's <laughs> not in the mood to get excited. And then you start having to try to appeal to that curiosity aspect of him. Like, Hmm, this turkey's are being a little bit shy you know, how are we going to provoke his curiosity? Because turkeys are curious animals. So then you start trying yeah. to uh, just paint the picture of a, a hen that's just as in, in, uninterested in him as he is in us. And then it piques his curiosity, you know, and then you're, yeah. you know, you're doing sounds that 
aren't directed at him, clucking and purring, scratching in the leaves. It's just like a, a turkey being a turkey, and he's hearing that stuff, and then you know he may gobble, and I may completely ignore it. I may completely just yeah. continue going right on with my clucking and purring and, and almost act like I didn't even hear it. And so then you're appealing to kind of his curiosity and maybe even a jealousy factor. Um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so there's, there's a lot of different, you know, ways you can, you can, uh, uh, slice that pie, but you know, that's just a couple of them that, that come to mind. Well, I want to, I got one more question that I'm curious about. Um, I don't want to keep you hanging around all day. So whenever you get yourself a turkey on the ground, you always light up a cigar. Mm-hmm. I'm curious how and when did that tradition start and why? That was a Chubbs thing. Like I'm Chubbs and I started hunting together in 2000, probably 15, I guess, maybe or 14, maybe 14. Um, and he, um, had some mentors like, uh, where I had to cut my own teeth and kind of, um, was kind of, you know, a self-taught turkey hunter. Um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, he had some mentors that were really good turkey hunters and kind of, um, uh, gave him some, um, I don't want to say, I mean, they just, they just, he picked up on a lot of their, what they were putting down, I guess. And and one yeah. of the things that they kind of, uh, instilled within him was that whole, um, slow down, take a moment, um, something that kind of everybody, or at least I always did, but not to the, not to the extent, um, that he did, that Chubbs did. And it was a cigar that he used to make sure that we were, uh, you know, he was going to slow down. He was going to take a moment. And so, man, I just adopted it. Uh, we hunted so much together for those few years that we don't get to hunt together as much now, uh, with my travels and, and, uh, we moved apart. He used to live right down the road from me. So, um, mm-hmm. uh, with the logistics now, it just doesn't happen as much, but, um, yeah, that was a, that was a him thing, and it was just a it was just a way to slow down, make sure that we weren't rushing through anything, because you know spring only comes around once a year, so it can be kind of easy yeah. to get into a haste and want to have another experience, and um, you know it was just kind of one of those things that we that that just kind of make sure that we were savoring the moment and, and making sure we were taking everything we were given and and kind of soaking in it for a minute. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I think that you might have you might have been alluding to it a little bit earlier. Uh, when you're kind of talking about things you were seeing in the turkey world that you didn't quite like, I think that, yeah, everyone is so quick to, all right, we just killed it. Let's make sure we get our Instagram videos. Let's make sure we get our pictures. Let's make sure we get it in the car, this and that. Um, and yeah, I really, I just like that element like that, that forces us a second to just sit down, think about what you just did, remember, you know, really ingrain the experience in your head and just slow down and enjoy creation, enjoy where you're at. And I've, I've always, I just thought it was cool. You did that anyway. Cause I mean, I was like, this dude's just chilling with a dead Turkey, smoking a cigar in the middle of the woods. Yeah. That's, and I'm here. That's our thing. I'm, I'm here watching on the internet. What am I doing? <laughs> like I need to get out there and do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. It's but, just uh, uh, something we did. And I like, I'm glad that's one of the aspects that kind of people, clung to was that whole slowdown, uh, the respects paid, um, and appreciate it and savor the moment. Um, and it can also be used as a learning experience because man, if you really slow down and kind of break down the hunt, you know, piece by piece, there's always something to learn from every one of them. Um, and you know, if you watch our episodes, um, you know, we're, we're always there to, to, uh, kind of an educated guess on what we think happened and what he was thinking and why he did this and why, what, what killed the turkeys quote unquote, and, um, Mm -hmm. how we were able to change his mind or how we were able to get in the position that we were and what he did to let us know that was a position we needed to be in. So if you slow down rather than just, you know, killing one, picking him up and heading to the truck, um, there's a lot of learning to be had there. And, um, like I said, I mean, there's, there's no more, um, feeling of accomplishment, just an absolute, uh, moment of Zen to sit there, smoke a cigar, um, yeah. just, uh, you know, use that moment to, uh, you know, become a better turkey hunter really. Yeah. Do you have a cigar of choice or just whatever is at the gas? We, you, we have this little cheap Swisher sweet cigars that's <laughs> available everywhere. Yeah. We don't, yeah. we don't smoke anything serious. <laughs> yeah. 
And it's a nasty well, habit. I mean, it's nasty. I mean, it's there's nothing cool <laughs> about smoking, really. I mean, it's just it's nasty. Um, uh, I, I don't suggest it, and especially if you're a kid, you know, don't don't pick right. this habit up. But it was just our thing. It's just how we slowed down, and um, you know, it's just it's kind of ballooned into what it is now. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't think that. I mean, at this point you know, it wouldn't be a Pinhoti project video without it. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like you're, you're, that's the, just the last little cherry on top after a successful hunt. And, you know, I, I think it's awesome that you guys take the time to just chill, relax, just enjoy the moment you just had. And, you know, like I said, in the world we're in, everything is always the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And we miss so much, so many great things because we're just, we're constantly moving. So I think that's really cool that you guys do that. Um, well, I don't, like I said, I don't want to keep you a, a whole hell of a lot longer here. I appreciate you coming on here. This has been just an honor for me to have you on. Um, just a great conversation too. Uh, for everyone who's listening, who's like, why don't you ask him how to kill a bird that's hung up at 80 yards? I'm sure you can find that somewhere. I just <laughs> wanted to have a... <laughs> I just want to, I, like I said, I'm, I'm very thankful for this time with you and just having a conversation with you. And, uh, I wish you the best of luck. Um, I do need you to continue putting videos out cause that's the only way I learn. <laughs> so keep, <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. Um, I know a lot of, a lot of guys I talk to, um, have also just learned so much from you and the way that you do your videos. Like I said, it's not always, you're just running around, kill it. And it's over. There's always like, talk of what's going on in the situation, why you're doing things, why did you do this and that, and that, that helps all of us who are just brand new to it. Um, that helps us learn a lot because there's, there's only so much in my two years of hunting, like there's only so much experience that I can gain in those two years. Like I can't, there's nothing else I can do, but being able to watch guys like you who have a ton of experience and kind of steal things here and there from you that I just haven't experienced yet myself. Uh, I mean, it helps us out so much. So thanks for doing what you're doing. You're doing an excellent job with it, obviously. Um, and yeah, if anyone out there has been living under a rock and they don't know where to find you, where can they find you and the Pinhoti project online? Uh, well, first, thank you for the compliments and it was a pleasure to be here and pleasure to have the discussion. It was a, a unique perspective that you kind of, uh, spun the web there it was it was it was different <laughs> than just uh what do you do on a hung up gobbler kind of discussion so uh, i appreciate that but uh you can find uh us on uh youtube and uh mossy oak go are the two streaming platforms that you can find our content on under uh the penhody project or dave owens the penhody project um of course we have instagram facebook uh like everybody else and uh the website we have a website you can kind of get to all of that stuff from the website and uh, we do the, you know, we do the apparel and the merch and we also have, you know, a little bit of everything on the website. We do recipes on there because one of my most common, uh, questions is like, what do you do with all them turkeys? There's no way you eat all those turkeys. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, we do. Oh, hell yes, yeah, we do. We do. And if you jump on the website, um, there's just a handful of, uh, of recipes on there that we use. So I try to kind of make the website kind of that one-stop shop where you can find us and kind of channel you to anything that you want to look for when it comes to the Penhody project. So. Awesome. And you guys, you make, do you still make mouth calls? Yes. Is that still a... Yeah, that's, that's my thing is now, I make a bunch if, of mouth calls. If you buy a Pinhoti mouth call, is it guaranteed that we're going to sound similar? Yeah, it's, it's got a lot more to do. <laughs> it's got a lot more to do with the, uh, the composer than the instrument. So, uh, I can't oh, make any so promises. I can just make, we're still screwed. I can just tell you that they work for me. <laughs> yeah, no guys, make sure. Thank, thank you again for coming on here. Make sure you guys, I'm I'm sure all of the listeners from my show have already followed you, already following along. But if you're not, make sure you do that, guys. Um, and thank you so much for coming on. Make sure you guys are following us as well at Antler Feather Co. on Instagram, YouTube, all those good things. Um, the one thing I'm going to ask you to do this week is the same as last week, share the show. That's the most valuable thing you can do to help me out is get this show out there. Um, obviously, my AF Co family has been, you know, you guys have been awesome in doing that. And again, that allows us to get Dave Owens on the show. Um, and that's, that's just freaking awesome. So thank you guys for doing what you do. Um, continue to do it. And if you found value in the show, if you put something new 
I guess I can't say in the quiver because we're there's one question. I was gonna leave. Do you got two minutes? Yeah, sure. Why don't you bow hunt turkeys? Uh, it's just I think it's in the Bible somewhere that turkeys are meant to be shot Thank the head you. of the shotgun. Like, Thank <laughs> you. I say this every time. People are like, why don't you ar- you're exclusive archery hunter? I'm like, except for turkeys. Except for turkeys. I'm the same turkeys way. Turkeys like, were made to be shot by a shotgun. Yep. It's yep. true. <laughs> well, awesome. <laughs> well, guys, if you've got, uh, I don't know how to spin this pun. If you've got something, a new shotgun shell to put in the shotgun, whatever. If you enjoyed the shell, like it, share it, all that good stuff. And guys, we will, uh, oh, I messed, I messed my own outro up. Guys, ultimately when you do all that stuff, it is going to make you more deadly in the woods. So for Dave, for Vince, thank you guys so much for listening. We'll catch you next Thursday. This is the Antler and Feather Co. Podcast. You are listening to the Antler and Feather Co. Podcast.